Welcome to tonight's program, Eyewitness on Libya with Cynthia McKinney and other distinguished panelists. My name is Rocio Silverio and I am an organizer with the International Action Center. And I'm especially um, connected to, to, to tonight's event just because my family is from the Dominican Republic um, or Quisqueya, as most people know as the Dominican Republic and Haiti. We have an intimate relationship with imperialism, um, a violent history with U.S. imperialism on the island, and a lot of that is tied to the work that we do here in the U.S. to, to make sure that those forces don't have the time to go abroad and unleash uh, the, the terror that they do. I would like to introduce Minister Robert Coleman. He is the Chief Program Minister here at the Riverside Church. It's great to have you all here this evening, and I welcome you all on behalf of my clergy colleagues and the congregation of the Riverside Church in the city of New York. Just one month ago, today, around uh, in late uh, June, I was in this very spot and was joined by the Honorable Ramsey Clark as we paid tribute to Reverend Lucius Walker and Pastors for Peace. <laughs> And we also sent forth our blessings on a freedom caravan, once again the 22nd annual caravan to Havana, Cuba, taking medicines and supplies, churches from all over the country, and several Riverside members are now, as we speak in Havana, helping to make those connections again for our church. But tonight, it is with a deep respect and a personal privilege to welcome former Congresswoman and Green Party presidential candidate, Ms. Cynthia McKinney, to the Riverside Church. <laughs> Ms. McKinney brings a lifetime of commitment to peace and justice, and I don't need to tell you in this room that, you know it. On the national and international scene, she has spoken prophetically to the powers that be, speaking the truth to the powers that be, that makes them shake sometimes. Her presence with us tonight strikes me as a stark reminder of Dr. King's Beyond Vietnam speech on April 4th, 1967. And that speech. Dr. King's Beyond Vietnam speech was delivered right above my head from the nave of this church to a clergy and lady concern gathering on that date, one year to the date from the time where he was murdered on the balcony of the Lorraine, the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, Tennessee. He spoke prophetically that night about what he called the evil triplets and also labeling the greatest purveyor of violence in the world, the United States. He spoke of those triplets, racism, militarism, and materialism. And I sadly would profess that those are still alive and well in this country these many decades after that speech. The inertia that is accompanying an, an economy of unchecked capitalism and corrupted by the failed strategies of security provided through shock and awe policies and practices perpetuates suffering both locally, nationally, and globally. And those who suffer most are the poor and marginalized of the world, our sisters and brothers in Libya and in Haiti and in Cuba and all around the world on every continent. Where are the voices of prophecy now? Where are those speeches like that one on April 4th, 1967? I dare say that the closest I have heard in public speech comes from our guest tonight, Ms. Cynthia McKinney, and I thank you so much for joining us. In her own words, she said, I want to say categorically and very clearly that these policies of war are not what the people, the people of the United States stand for, and it's not what African Americans stand for. Under the economic policies of the Obama administration, those who have the least are losing the most, and those who have the most are getting even more. 
The situation in the United States is becoming more dire for the average ordinary Americans. And the last thing we need to do is to spend money on death, destruction, and war. These words caused me to revisit Dr. King's speech. I've been here four years, and we remember that date and have a program here every April 4th. And I've read that speech multiple times. And these words from Ms. McKinney make me find hope in my soul that there's still people out there saying these things to this nation, saying these things to where the bullets are made, where the bombs are put together, where the economy benefits most from global war and suffering and violence. Ms. McKinney is speaking to the powers that be. She's calling us to live up to our ideals across faith lines, across race lines, across economic lines to speak justice for everybody around the world. And so on behalf of my colleagues, again, and the Riverside Church, it is my distinct honor to welcome, in, welcome in a gracious and loving way, our sister, Miss Cynthia McKinney, to the Riverside Church. Halifa Elderback is a Libyan brother who is studying here. You should hear about the fact that he's going to get his master's and PhD and he will not have the enormous debt that students who are lucky enough to go to school nowadays have on their backs because the Libyan government is paying for his education and one of the reasons why U.S. imperialism has gone after Libya. So please welcome Brother Khalifa Elderback. Uh, the truth from an eyewitness who have been who has been there in Libya in the ground and not from the uh, the media reports I'm as a uh, Libyan student have been um, guaranteed uh, a scholarship from the government to uh, pursue my graduate studies at the United States and I'm one of about 12,000 Libyan students who has been uh, 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 offered a scholarship by the government to to pursue their graduate studies abroad. We are about 2,000 Libyan students here in the United States. Um, I would like to thank uh, Ms. McKinney because because of her courage and bravery and to uh, travel to Libya in this um, hard time and to be a part of uh, a finding, uh, finding fact mission to see the, the truth by her own eyes. Because I am here with my family, my wife and two children and when the event took place, we've been watching TV, as um, many of you, and we have been hearing the uh, news on mainstream media. And when I first heard the news, I was so um, f frustrated, so, I mean, I, I, I was so um, um, anxious of the reports I've heard from the, from the, from the media. I mean, they were telling things that make a person crazy because my parents, my six brothers and sisters, my 25 nephews and nieces live in Tripoli. And, and I was listening to the uh, CNN and they were telling that um, the government was using the airplanes to bomb a certain town called Sugal Juma where I came from. And Imagine my wife and I, uh, uh, the situation we were in because of that. I mean, our parents, our, our sisters, brothers were living there. And the first thing we, we decided to do is to call. We did call everybody of our family. And everyone we called, he was laughing when we told him what he heard in the news. They were telling us that was not true. And I, I, I was talking to my wife. I said, no, maybe they just they don't want to tell us. So let us call some, somebody else. We tried to call 
I mean, we, try, we called maybe over 50 of our family members that night to see if that, what, he, what we've heard in the news is true or not, and, and came is not true. But after the NATO involvement, my, the same town was um, attacked by, 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 from air over 500 times. Many of my own tribe were killed in, in Tripoli. So this is just to tell you how we were feeling here and as, 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 as uh, Libyans who live in the United States and hearing or listening to the media and, um, and the media is what is telling is something totally different from the reality. And so that's why I was so anxious to hear from uh, Ms. McKinney because she was there. So when I heard her first time on Libyan TV, was, which was bombed like this morning, the Libyan TV was bombed where, where Ms. McKinney was talking uh, on air in, in, in one of the bubbler shows in, in Libyan TV. So I was so anxious to hear from her. And I, when she came back here, I, I heard the truth, the same truth that my family was telling, telling me. I really appreciate your, your, what you have been doing here to bring up the truth, to, 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 to tell the people what, that the reality of the event, what was going on there. So I, I really thank every one of you because you came to listen to an eyewitness, to hear the reality, the truth, the real truth. And I would like to thank very much Ms. McKinney for her courage to be the first of the people who went to Libya and to see uh, with her own eyes what was going on. And I'd like to encourage many of you to be a part of a facts-finding mission to visit Libya and see the, the reality, to see what, what, what's the, the, uh, the truth with your own eyes. Thank you very much. And I, 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 uh, I'm so glad to be a part of this program. Thank you very much again. Thank you. From a Libyan student studying in the US to a high school student from the South Bronx, we have Dainé Anderson, who is a coordinator of the Food is a Right campaign organized by the Solidarity Center Brigade. And she is an activist also with the International Action Center. I just really want to thank Ms. McKinney for being here. And um, this has given me a lot of courage to really speak. And I'm honored to speak in your presence and to be in front of everybody. So thank you. <laughs> is really focused about is food is a right. Food is a right for Americans. Food is a right for the world, basically. And not only are we fighting for the SNAP program, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, but we are fighting for WIC, Women, Infants, and Children Program. We're fighting for no cuts in these programs as well as food pantries and food banks. And um, our brigade has stretched to, um, from the South Bronx to um, down in Union Square at the Waverly Food Center, Food Stamp Center, and we've been petitioning for the last month and a half, and we've gotten hundreds of signatures because of one thing, food is a right. So let me just give you a couple of background on food stamps, some statistics basically. Um, 44 million Americans alone have food stamps, but yet 
There are people in this country that still are starving. There are three million people in this state that have food stamps, but yet people still starve. There are 1.7 million people in this city, five boroughs, that rely on this program, but people starve. And out of the 100% of people in this country who are eligible for food stamps, only 57% get these benefits. But, you know, we need food. And it's very important. And this is very unfortunate because, you know, upcoming debt ceiling crisis, you know, August 2nd when things are supposed to go downhill, but they want to cut. And you know what? They are basically spending our tax money on is more. It is a great honor to welcome Cynthia McKinney here tonight for all the reasons that have already been stated multiplied by 10. Now it is my great honor to introduce to you Ramsey Clark, the former U.S. Attorney General under the Johnson government. If I was ever introduced without being called the former Attorney General, I think I'd faint. <laughs> and I've never fainted yet, but I feel like it every time I'm introduced that way. I mean, that's been 40 some odd years ago. You got to be able to overcome sins at some point. <laughs> It's the first time I ever said that after hundreds of times. <laughs> I don't know what got into me. I apologize, Mr. Hoover. <laughs> there are two news items that um, in the last 24 hours that are instructive if we think. This morning, CBS reported that, uh, as everybody assumed, I think, that violence in Iraq today is greater than it was last year or 10 years ago, which in a way shows you what's at stake in Libya and in Egypt and in all of Africa, really, because uh, the targets are sub to harrow overwhelmingly. The other one is a story that I've followed a, a long time and watched it happen. That is, Iraqis fleeing to Syria for safety. But if there's one thing that the press has been telling us for the last uh, eight or ten weeks it is that Syria is the most violent government <laughs> in the whole area. And yet the people of Iraq, the poor people of Iraq, <laughs> take their chances there, leaving their homes and their friends and their history. And they haven't been going back. And Syria has been giving them free education if their kids can get there. They're giving them free medical care. Syria didn't have open relations with Libya for more than 35 years. We were trying to take infant formula and other urgently needed medicines into Libya, into um, Iraq during the Iraq uh, sanctions. We finally got one truck through uh, Syria. We had to go to the foreign ministry and plead. I'll tell you this, it was amazing. We had banners on the side of the truck that said, uh, medicine for the children of Iraq. And once we pulled into any crowd, we could hardly move because they'd stand around and cheer. These are the people of Syria. 
that someone was doing something to try to help uh, the children there. But th the main moral of that story is that we can't rely on the media, we can't rely on what we're told, we have to use our knowledge and our common sense and make some harsh judgments. Some judgments are pretty easy to make. The U.S. initiated and to this day forced assault on Libya is by the clearest definition of international law a war of aggression. And if we read the Nuremberg Judgment, which we ought to from time to time, and indeed the Nuremberg Charter, we we'll see that in those days we thought the supreme international crime, that's the word that was used at Nuremberg, was the war of aggression. And uh, the United States has waged this war in more devious ways than usual. It's been more successful in getting other people to do our fighting. It's been more successful in the media, which is brutalized the Libyan people and the Libyan government, the real government, the government that was there before, the government that lived for 40 years in peace. Libya had no war since the end of the desert campaign on its soil in early 1943 until Ronald Reagan decided to bomb Tripoli and Benghazi in 1986. At that time, our Secretary of Defense, Caspar Weinberger, said it was impossible that anyone was killed. And I got there in a few days, and after visiting hospitals, literally hospitals in Rome and uh, Geneva and in uh, Vienna, were primarily fire burn cases that couldn't be handled in Libya because the, old, the, the hospitals were overflowing work. We finally filed a lawsuit for 300 plus people uh, who were killed on behalf of their survivors and their families. We have to end this brutal assault on Libya. You know, it's a huge country physically. It's bigger than Alaska. It's two and a half times my home state of Texas. It's got fewer people than New York City. And here we are waging an all-out war against them. And you have to be blind not to see that the people of Libya support the government of Tripoli. I mean, we supported Mubarak in Egypt for years, and Sadat before that. <laughs> How long did he last? He didn't last any time. Ben Ali in Tunisia. You've got Egypt on the east and Tunisia on the west of Libya. Neither U.S. supported government could last two weeks against the people. But the people of Libya have lasted months now against the combined might of the United States, which destroyed all of its aircraft in a few days. Easy to do if you've got our technology and our numbers. Destroyed most of their armored equipment. Left them terribly handicapped in trying to defend their their people, and yet they are prevailing, and if there's justice, they will prevail. And we have to do everything in our power to see that they do prevail, but beyond this, we have to learn the major lesson. There's only one reason that any of this could happen, and has happened. Going back to Korea and Vietnam and the scores of brutal wars we've waged against people. And that's the United States military budget. Until we cut that budget 90%, our country will supply others and use arms itself against people all over the world where it chooses to steal their property or have our way there. Until we do that, no, no matter what else we do, we cannot be proud of this country because we are manufacturing the means of death worldwide. It has to end, and that's the way. And so next we have Mr. Glenn Ford.
who is the executive editor of the Black Agenda Report, an online news journal that provides news analysis and commentary from the black left. I think it's safe to say for the first time in a very long time that we might get our movement back again. And of course that is the most important thing because as the capitalist edifice crumbles all around us, the people have no defense, no defense whatsoever without a movement. Now many of us seem to have forgotten that truth and decided that movement politics could be abandoned for the sake of electing a black president, the same candidate that was backed by Wall Street. So it should have come as no surprise that we would wind up with finance capital so emboldened that they are attempting to swallow the state apparatus whole of the entire industrial capitalist world. That is what is occurring right now in Europe, and that is the root of the unfolding crisis in Washington today. We should all, we should all remember that it was Obama who announced two weeks before he was even sworn in as president that he was determined to put all of the entitlements on the table for cutting. That meant Social Security and Medicaid and Medicare and a lot more, all of the rest. He said, let's have a grand alliance. Let's have a glorious, nonpartisan, budget-cutting coalition. And that's what we got. And he told his friends on Wall Street and his friends at the Pentagon, don't worry about the blacks. Don't worry about those people who call themselves progressives, because I got them in my pocket. And he said, don't worry about the blacks and the progressives, because they don't have a movement. And basically, at that time, he was right. But we are beginning uh, to do our own historical correction. The straw that broke the camel's back, that brought so many people back to their senses, was the brazen attack on Libya. U.S. imperialism joined its blood-stained hands with European imperialism with a huge military offensive in Africa. And the most effective and the most important counterweight in the United States to Obama's war against Libya has been centered around Cynthia McKinney. She is the biggest single asset the peace movement has at this very moment. She is the eyewitness to imperial aggression. She is the eyewitness, and she is the moral and political leader at this moment. The Black is Back Coalition salutes you, Cynthia McKinney. We at the Black is Back Coalition also have an obligation to call attention to the virulent racism that is promoted by NATO's junior partners in Libya, the so-called rebels. They have fanned the flames of racial hatred as a weapon of war. In the first weeks of the rebellion out of Benghazi, they slaughtered hundreds of black African migrant workers, and they killed untold numbers of black Libyan citizens. They invented legions of black mercenaries, and they claimed that a 5,000-man force from Chad was defending the city of Brega. Even Amnesty International, and Amnesty International is no friend of Colonel Gaddafi, but even Amnesty International said that this was all nonsense. There were no black legions of mercenaries. But what we have learned is that the rebels are carrying out ethnic cleansing on a huge scale in the parts of Libya that they control. They have eliminated entire neighborhoods of black Libyans in Misurata. They have laid siege 
to a town about 25 miles away. And they put graffiti up and down the roads, vowing to purge the country of black skin. This is the force that is sponsored by our first black president. This is the kind of Arab Spring that is envisioned by Obama and his European friends. And this, this is yet another reason that black people in the United States must assume our rightful position in the forefront of the anti-war movement. Cynthia McKinney has always been there. Lots of us used to be there before the Obama fiasco. Now is the time for all of us to get back in the ranks. It's movement time once again. Power to the people. Brother Louis Farrakhan's representative, Brother Akbar Mohammed. First, I want to uh, thank Cynthia McKinney because little did she know when we made that trip in January uh, to Libya and Brother Gaddafi had brought it, invited us on a form that he was creating for the migrants, mainly African migrants in Europe, which is a tremendous problem. Gaddafi went to Brussels. Uh, they and the Italians, they promised him six million dollars, six billion, excuse me, if he could help solve the migrant problem that they were having in Europe, and being that many of them came through uh, Libya because of Libya's uh, open border policy during the days of the sanctions. And uh, Gaddafi said he needed 16 billion, not six. But it was a great problem. We went there on the heels of that. And at that conference, Gaddafi wanted to pour into the African Union another $90 billion. And so that, as uh, my brother just said, so that North Africa would not be swallowed up into Europe. Europe wanted to subsume North Africa. And uh, I've been going to Libya for a long time. As a matter of fact, my relationship with Brother Gaddafi has been solid uh, since we first went there in 1977. And in all relationships, you have some bumps and some ups and downs, but Gaddafi has been consistent. And uh, for those who are Muslims in the audience or from the Arab world, Gaddafi uses the term, you know, you Meccans best know your roots. In your struggle, you know best what to do, and that has been his position. And what hurts me today, as we get ready to start our fast of Ramadan, Ramadan is a time of joy for Muslims. We don't fast with long faces and look hungry, but it's a challenge to each one of us as we go into it. We love to see our children when they become of age that they can fast. And to show the disrespect for the Muslim world, will they stop bombing? Uh, in Libya during Ramadan and say this is a holy time for all of them regardless of what side you're on. But all you have to do is look at the history of America in the West. I don't care what you thought about Saddam Hussein. If you go through the streets of uh, Baghdad tomorrow morning with a microphone and ask the Iraqis, are you better off now than you were under Saddam Hussein? I guarantee you to the letter, they said I hated him. But I had security, I had peace, my children went to school, I could go to the hospital, and people were not killed in the streets every day. But when they killed Saddam Hussein, they killed him on the Muslim Eid, under the directions of the United States of America. It wasn't the Iraqi leaders who said, we're going to hang him on the morning of Eid. It wasn't the Iraqi leaders who let the opposition in to take uh, pictures of him. And you could have differences with him. You could have called him whatever you want to, but the whole pretext of what they did in Iraq was an absolute lie given to the United Nations by a black man. So there are two important words in the Arabic language. One is mutakbo, the future. And when I saw those young students coming up here, they represent the future. We're old war horses, starting with the Vietnam War, which was an unholy war that we lost 58,000 innocent young Americans. And those who made it out of the war became drug addicts, the homeless. If you comb the homeless right now, many of them are veterans from Vietnam. 
And it was all based on a, a lie and this whole premise of building the American empire. And should we stand by and watch this happen again? This is why Barack, knowing an election is coming up, saying no ground troops, but he's doing even worse damage because he went in there based on a lie, I want to save some civilians. So I'm just going to say, and I know that we have some brothers and sisters who are with the uh, Libyan uh, opposition, uh, the rebels who have uh, America has bombing your country and taking sides in a civil war. But when Muammar Gaddafi turned towards Africa, and you have to know that history, I don't have time to do it tonight, but when the sanctions were on him and the Arab League and nobody would stand up to the UN or America, accusing him in the Pan Am, accusing him in the Bella Disco in Germany, and nobody would stand for him, he said, I'm an African, and he turned to the African leaders. And the African leaders were hurting because the aid that was coming from a country at that time of five million people helped each African country. And now he was strapped down under these sanctions that made Libya lose $30 billion and countless lives on that highway driving from Tripoli to Gerba or taking an overnight ship to Malta. And so when the African leaders said that if they don't list the sanctions, we will break the sanctions and fly into CERT and tell Muammar Gaddafi that we are with him against the U.S. and U.N. imposed sanctions on Libya. And then he turned his attention to the African countries and began to support them. The Western world didn't want this. So when Barack Obama, if he's an honest broker and not a warmonger, Barack Obama would have said to the American people that I'm going to uh, lead the charge in invading Libya. And what I, it's going to happen to you, you're going to pay $5 a gallon for gas. I'm going to spend $10 million a day supporting this effort after I pull our planes out. And in an economy that is in shambles, I'm going to spend this kind of money in order to support a war, not to uh, help the civilians in Benghazi, but in order that we can get those rich oil fields, in order that we can give, uh, give the... Uh, give the Zionist state of Israel the water that they will need in the next 50 years that is found under the desert of Libya and Darfur. And so therefore, in order to make this happen, we got to get rid of Muammar Gaddafi because he's not a ball player. We thought we could cultivate him and bring him in, but he wouldn't play ball. So according to John Perkins in the economic hitman, if they don't play ball, you bring out the gun. And that's what they have done on Muammar Gaddafi. Please welcome Miss Cynthia McKinney. I really bowled away by uh, the turnout, the energy, the spirit. And, um, well, Glenn Ford bowls me away every time he opens his mouth, you know. He is so smart. <laughs> um, and I'm almost at a loss of words, too, because... Um, Look at where we are. We're at the Riverside Church. And during the time that I was in the Congress, I dedicated much of my activities to the life, but most importantly, the murder of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. And so to be so warmly received at this place is particularly special to me. Um, today I, I woke up and I have to tell you, I don't know if it was because I was uh, tired or um, didn't get enough sleep, didn't go to sleep until three o'clock this morning, but um, I woke up with, like, death on my mind. And I guess that's appropriate because war equals death. And war also equals stolen lives. New York City has a lot of experience with stolen lives. From Amadou Diallo, and those whose names we do not know, 
who came before him, to Sean Bell and those whose names we do not know, who came after him, all of their families and friends, an entire community and nation mourn senseless losses of life. Perhaps we are most familiar with the stolen lives as a result of police misconduct. We go inside the lives and families of individuals who knew and who are all victims. In a way, their solitary deaths make them come alive for us. I know that Oscar Grant could just as easily have been my son, and therefore he is my son, as all of children are my children. And then there is the Native American gentleman of Seattle, Washington, a well-known wood carver who was carrying a block of wood and a three-inch whittling knife. The image was captured on the police officer's own camera. And the police officer told him, put the knife down, put the knife down, put the knife down. But the gentleman was both deaf and mute. And the gentleman paid with his life. There's another video that's on the internet. It's of a young 19-year-old who was in San Francisco. I saw the photograph, and he's lying in a pool of his own blood. He's dead from a gunshot wound. It appears that he might have shot himself. When a police officer suspected that he had not paid his $2 transfer, and so told him to give him the proof of the transfer, and the young man, 19 years old, took off and started running. And now he's dead. And so despite whatever the information is about the death of this young 19-year-old, he's dead. His life, his future, is stolen. But there are also other ways in which lives are stolen. Corporate or environmental disasters. For example, we saw what happened with Katrina. It did not have to happen that so many lives were disrupted that people lost their lives. It did not have to happen, but it did happen just with Katrina. People are now suffering and dying in a health crisis from the BP disaster in the Gulf of Mexico. Now, there were some of us who warned that there were going to be health effects from cleaning up that environment there, but the government failed to inform the workers of the hazards just like they failed the first responders right here in New York City on September 11. I watched recordings of a beautiful Gulf of Mexico area resident who inexplicably began to break out and then she became bloated and then she died. And there are people right now in all of those Gulf states, from Texas all the way to Florida, who are dying because they have not been told the risks, just like people in Japan have not been told the risks from the nuclear fallout from Fukushima. They weren't even told the risks when their government was peddled nuclear production, nuclear power, by the United States. 
Our own people in the western part of our country haven't been told the dangers from the fallout from Fukushima either. And we need to be taking some strong measures to protect ourselves as people are being tested and found positive for, your, for uh, radioactive iodine and cesium. Stolen lives result from the use and abuse of drugs that caused this country to incarcerate so many people. But they incarcerate the ones who take the drugs or who use the drugs because their lives are desperate and they are sometimes without hope. But who gets punished when the government is responsible for trafficking the drugs? When the government creates even new drugs that didn't exist, the government tra trafficked in cocaine and created crack cocaine that devastated an entire community across this country. Every family has been touched by crack cocaine. Generations have suffered. Generations have had their lives stolen because of drugs. Max Kaiser reported on Russia Today that Warren Buffett's Wachovia, now Wells Fargo, based its entire existence on liquidity provided by the drug trade. But I don't see anybody questioning Warren Buffett or the CEOs of all of these banks who are laundering drug money. Another way that lives are stolen is when an economy is mismanaged such that money to kill people is plentiful, but dollars for education and to heal people and to feed and shelter and clothe people is scarce. This kind of mismanagement of a national economy steals lives from our country. It steals hope from people who need it the most. It steals opportunity from people who deserve it. And it steals a future from all of us. Wars, crimes against the peace, are perhaps the biggest crimes of all. How sad to be at Riverside Church today to stop yet another US war. The news of NATO for today shows an organization in disarray. Look at how far they've come. In Kosovo and Serbia is on fire today. Kosovo is recognized by 78 states, but not Serbia. NATO troops had to make a tactical retreat but threatened to use force if blocked again by the people who used their bodies, tires, and wood piles to block NATO from areas in Kosovo. NATO has to deal with the murder now of their chief Libyan military advisor, a gentleman by the name of Yunus. But the wires are reporting today that Eunice's son, as they lowered his body into the ground, yelled out, we want Moama to come back. We want the green flag back. <laughs> and besides stealing the life from all of the six million people who live in Libya, NATO is also stealing life from all of the rest of Africa. NATO is stealing life from the Gambia to Congo Brazzaville to Niger, Mauritania, the African Union, and Africans in the diaspora. Brother Akbar is absolutely right. 
We were there in January and February of this year because we had been called there for a conference of concern about the dignity of Africans in the diaspora, and that includes people right here in the United States. Are we able to live in dignity outside of Africa? And what Muammar Gaddafi and the people of Libya said is if you cannot find dignity in your life abroad, then come back to Africa and you can start by helping to rebuild Libya. So when NATO makes war on this small six million people of one country on the entire continent of Africa, they're making war on all of us. Stolen lives. I'm sick and tired of stolen lives. And I'm sick and tired of a government that would rather steal the life from the people it purports to serve than to serve the people. So I want to thank you all for being here. I thank you for your concern about the future of our country, the future of the people of Libya, the future of the people of this global community. We all have to live together. The last thing I would leave you with is this. We have the Congress and the President. They need to receive a message from us that we are sick and tired of war, that we are sick and tired of the stolen lives that are represented by a budget that prioritizes war over the people's needs. Send that message to them loud and clear. Thank you very much. Mr. Johnny Stevens of Workers World Party. And I will ask you all to come out on August the 13th, Saturday, for a march in Harlem against racism for Africa to support Zimbabwe against the brutal cuts of laying off teachers and taking jobs from workers. We stand with Libya today against the imperialist assault. The claim that NATO's goal is for democracy in Libya is a lie. Nobody elected the so-called rebels in Libya. These rebels have a lot in common with the 1860 Confederate rebels. The Libyan rebels have lynched black African workers. The racist Merrill attacking leader Mohar Gaddafi can be seen in the rebellion cap rebel capital of Benghazi. The military industrial complex in the United States has also made big bucks from attacking Libya. Hundreds of cruise missiles have been fired and now it has to be replaced. That's good for business for Boeing, Lockheed, and the rest of the merchants of death. Each missile costs at least $1.4 million. That's enough money to hire 20 teachers. To present the next speaker, who is Imam Ayub Abdul Baki, President of the Islamic Leadership Council of and because we are in desperate times, we have to have desperate measures. We need to galvanize ourselves and become more and more conscious that America is in, is in a crisis. It's on the verge of going either one or two ways. Either it can move in a progressive sense towards representing what it states in its constitution and its declaration of independence, human rights, or it will move backwards to a period where it victimizes its minorities. As it victimized African Americans, they are victimizing Muslims today as well as immigrants. They are stigmatizing 
vilifying and demonizing people to make them a scapegoat for what is going wrong in America so that the American people will not look at in a real sense at what is going on internally that this whole system needs to be overhauled. That America needs to be changed in a fundamental change, not in a superficial sense like Obama said. We just don't say change and that's going to solve the problem. We know that America has to move in a new direction and it will take people to do that. And during the time of struggle, it all, there's always three types of people. It is those who are committed to the struggle and who are in the fields and who are challenging the status quo. And it is on the, on the other side, those who stand in opposition. And it is always the people who are in the middle who are confused about which direction to take and whether, and whether to go this way or that way. But we have to convince the American people that they have an interest in stopping the war in Libya. And they have an interest in getting out of Iraq and Afghanistan. And they have an interest in terms of supporting the Palestinian people right to self-determination. And they have an interest in also trying to address the issue of poverty, hunger, disease, and ignorance within the confines of America. We have to dismantle the economic system in America so that money don't go to the greedy, it goes to the needy. That money don't go to the military industrial complex that is given to the people who are oppressed and who need the money. America has plenty of money. America has plenty of resources. But with a standing budget which is more and more given towards the military, how can they address the issue of feeding their people. How can we say we want to champion democracy all over the world when we have disguised hypocrisy? We say that we have the best system on the face of the earth. It can be better, and it should be better. And how it's going to be better is if we take those resources and begin to solve the rural issues of what's going on in America. Housing for everyone. Gaddafi has housing for the people in Libya. Free education for everyone. Why do we have to pay for our education? Because we're paying for bombs. We have to reassess the situation, and hopefully we will all move in the concerted effort to be there on August the 13th. I will be there as well. Assalamu alaikum. And CUNY student, Sasha Murphy. On behalf of the Answer Coalition, we want to salute Cynthia McKinney for her courage in bringing the truth about the Libyan war to the people here in the United States. We want to thank Brother Akbar Mohammed and former U.S. Attorney General Ramsey Clark, who has been speaking alongside Cynthia in cities around the United States. For our part, the Answer Coalition was honored to have been able to organize and host a number of these meetings in cities around the country. We also want to thank all of you who joined us July 9th, where we were in front of the White House in a demonstration demanding that this criminal imperialist war against Libya be brought to an end immediately. That's right. Because sisters and brothers, as we know, Libya possesses the largest oil reserves in all of Africa and the ninth largest oil reserves in the world. If oil production were to continue at today's current level, Libya has enough oil to keep producing at today's current level for the next 60 three years. That is a great prize that has been desired by Exxon Mobil, Chevron, and other major capitalist oil corporations in the United States and Europe. This is not a war to bring democracy or freedom 
or human rights to Libya? The motives of the NATO bombers are exactly the same as that which dominated the political thinking of European and US capitalism 130 years ago when these powers cruelly and without any consideration for the rights of the people in the continent divided almost all of Africa into colonies and spheres of influence. Recently, Brown University released a study documenting that the cost of the U.S. wars in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Pakistan will be in the neighborhood of 3.7 to 4.4 trillion dollars. And the study doesn't even include the mass expenditures for the bombing of Libya that started on March 19th of this year. Exactly eight years after the war criminal Bush launched the shock and awe evasion of Iraq in 2003. I can tell you sisters and brothers that when the government tells us, working class students, young workers, that there are no funds for education, housing, health care jobs or job training, and yet the same government can spend limitless funds to bomb Africa, that this current system has lost any shred of credibility and certainly possesses no moral authority to tell Libya or any oppressed people how they should or should not run their own country. The war against Libya is a rich man's war. The war against Libya is a colonial war. The war against Libya is a racist war. We, the people of the United States, we must stand together. We have to say no to the war in Libya. We have to stand together to say no to the occupations of Iraq and Afghanistan so we can say yes to housing, health care, and education.